All right. Um, welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining that session. My name is Patrick Brandt. I'm with the Julius Kuhn Institute. Um, that's a federal research center for cultivated plants in Germany. And I'd like to talk you through some of the work that I've been doing over the last two years or so, um, dealing with the question on how can we support um, the agricultural, the, of, the official agricultural statistics with things like machine learning, earth observation data, um, uh, and come up with a scalable crop yield estimation approach um, using a what we call a cloud integrated geospatial data infrastructure. Um, for those who haven't been dealing with um, official agricultural statistics data, uh, what is that? That's basically your uh, crop productivity, livestock productivity data um, that you can access, download from your national statistics provider um, or at European level from platforms such as um, Eurostat and at global level, if you will, from um, portals like FAO Stats. That's usually tabular data and it provides you yield productivity information at certain administrative levels. So what can we actually bring to the table? Uh, or how can we add value using machine learning and earth observation? Um, to illustrate that, I brought a, a map showing a random district in Germany where you can actually see um, yields estimated using the, the developed or prototyped approach that um, we have at the moment um, for winter weeds in the year of 2000. And it shows you a bit more than 5,000 agricultural parcels that we have estimated yields for. Um, if I compare that to the conventional uh, agricultural statistics um, and what they report currently on, you would get basically one value for that, one yield value for that particular crop in that year. So what we can bring to the table or add value is by adding granularity, adding um, resolution apart from other benefits that I'm uh, leaving aside right now. Um, why can we do that? Because remote sensing, Earth observation uh, data from Copernicus, Sandal 2, for example, is kind of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, gives us um, uh, spectral information of um, or about the, the cropland, uh, enabling us to monitor crop vitality uh, over time. Um, we get that information regularly in a few days uh, we have basically a new picture that we can um, use and update our, uh, uh, let's say, uh, modeling. And on the other hand, the machine learning part enables us to infer from a couple of uh, empirical reference data to large areas. Um, the aim here is really to, to estimate yields, not for a couple of parcels that are you know, located in a research farm or research station, but to cover hundreds of thousand parcels, eventually millions. Um, and in that research project, we have a, let's say, concrete implementation perspective because we have on board a couple of statistical practitioners, if you will, uh, a number of uh, state offices of statistics and the federal um, office of statistics in Germany. Um, but since it's a research project, um, we are targeting not all kinds of crops that are being cultivated, uh, but focus on three winter crops uh, that I uh, show here. That's winter wheat, winter barley, and winter rapeseed. So crops that are pretty dominant in terms of agriculture uh, area being cultivated uh, with those crops or under those crops and also yeah, um, show quite some relevance in terms of food supply, food security beyond, um, beyond Germany. Let's delve a bit deeper into the approach and um, look at the data um, that we're using. We're using multi-source geodata. One of the sources I've mentioned already, that's the Earth observation part that we use central two data uh, and derive biophysical crop traits, such as leaf area index, such as um, biomass using a, uh, an empirical approach 
uh, that's in the upper left corner here, um, uh, which is based on a hyperspectral, uh, hyperspectral crop library and statistical modeling. Um, those biophysical crop traits are actually key variables in, in crop growth modeling approaches and are commonly used actually for crop yield estimation. Um, then we have um, another domain that's uh, gridded meteorologi meteorological data from our weather forecast in Germany. Um, and there we use variables like precipitation, temperature, and global radiation. And the third domain is soil data, gridded soil data on physical chemical properties and soil moisture. Well, that's basically all integrated at parcel level and represents um, the X. Um, since we are using um, supervised regression estimators, um, we also need a Y, and that's the uh, empirical information or reference information on actual yields. And that's also a big shout out to all those farmers that kind of um, contribute or provide uh, yield data, because that's usually information that is hard to come by. So we are uh, lucky, although we are pretty still quite at the low, it's a lower range limit here, uh, or lower end in terms of what we actually need to run those approaches at scale. Um, and we also need, need land use data from a certain uh, season that kind of tells us where what crop uh, is actually grown because we are running crop specific um, models. Um, the approach is an uh, ensemble based approach, meaning that we uh, run a whole um, population, if you will, of supervised regression estimators. And that kind of enables us to have, um, yeah, also an ensemble of estimated yields for each and every parcel that we do the, the, the yield modeling for. And um, also allows us to work with that ensemble in terms of ensemble learning, um, also provides uncertainty potentially and um, it has been actually shown that um, there is not one single estimator that outperforms others that really varies across uh, uh, different crop types over time. So that actually now provides an opportunity to also work with a whole ensemble of estimated yields in order to come up with a robust or more robust um, solution in the end. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we estimate yields at parcel level, and then that information can be aggregated at higher levels using a grid, using administrative data. Um, the whole approach is, of course, quite data heavy, especially in terms of satellite data, um, and cannot be run on a local PC. So what you need is a, a kind of a potent geodata infrastructure, and at JKI we have implemented a what we call cloud integrated spatial data infrastructure, which consists of two components, if you like. Um, one part is kind of on premise and uh, has things like a data cube, vector data management. And, and then we have a cloud component um, where we basically have access to um, imagery repositories. Uh, we have computation power there and also community provided ARD data, which actually boosts quite a lot the pre-processing part on our end. Um, we are actually not really able to use like the typical big tech platform um, like Microsoft, Amazon, and so on, but we have a platform um, and that's operated by the German space agency called uh, CoTE, and that platform is really tailored to or for um, to be used by public organizations that are um, or want to, to use Earth observation data um, because public organizations often have, have to adhere to uh, data privacy regulations, IT security standards. Um, these commercial platforms wouldn't work. Um, so that's why we have um, or we are lucky actually to, to have platforms like CoTE uh, that we can actually use. Um, 
And whoever is interested in, 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 in setting up such an infrastructure uh, or really thinks about what to do in, our, in an organization uh, that is perhaps comparable to ours, we have published a, a preprint uh, where we kind of describe the process, the challenges, lessons learned, and that you can find following that link uh, or its code. The entire model, uh, modeling workflow is um, written in Python and sits on that cloud plot platform code TE, um, where we query data from internal and external data platforms, integrate them, do the pre-processing, um, creation of regression matrices, the whole model tuning part, cross-validation, and also the inference part. The results that come out there, so the estimated yields at scale, are then passed on to a web client where project partners can um, access visually uh, the results. Okay, where do we stand at the moment? Um, we have a prototype uh, in place right now and we can or are able to apply that um, to uh, two federal states in northern Germany, why two um, and not 16? Because what we are lacking at this st very stage is basically more reference data from other regions. Um, once we have that, perhaps in a second or third project phase, we could further scale that. Um, what you see here, though, on, on that map is um, estimated yields for winter wheat again, but uh, this time it is not five, but 80,000 parcels. And if I um, do the total count um, across the three crops, that's uh, then we're talking about 160,000 parcels at the moment per year. So that parcel level yield information can be aggregated to district level. Um, we get maps like that. And here we have actually um, the official yield numbers available from the statistics provider. And uh, of course, we want to know how far do we, or how, how close do we get to those numbers? We can simply compare our aggregated estimates against the uh, district level yields. And we have done that comparison uh, um, for these three crops um, from 2019 to 2022. And the results you can see here on the left-hand side uh, is R square. Uh, and behind each box is basically the full ensembles. Um, that we have run. And um, on the right-hand side, we see the normalized root mean square error. And what we see is uh, basically that we have, um, in terms of R square, uh, ranging between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9, except for one year, which uh, shows a bit of a drop in terms of R square for winter rapeseed. Um, and in terms of mean deviation from official statistics, we're talking about five to 10% when I'm looking at the median of those ensembles. Uh, I was also mentioning that we um, use the ensemble uh, basically one step further using approaches um, like meter learning, stacking regression, and more, let's say, conventional or simple approaches like majority voting. Um, simply in order to see if we can actually come up with a robust solution that is actually performing better than the ensemble median. And there, uh, it turns out at the moment at least that um, yeah, principles like majority voting would actually increase slightly the performance that you can see here um, on this rot, uh, red, uh, reddish dotted uh, uh, points there. The either above the median uh, in terms of R square or below the median in terms of um, mean error. Right. Um, a small teaser how actually data products could look like, because um, of course, this, this, this uh, whole exercise is not just to <laughs> produce maps, but also to eventually. Um, give some outlook in terms of what could be available in the future. And that's basically high resolution crop yield maps um, that are not available right now um, and are not possible right now using the conventional uh, agriculture statistics and data collections that are in place. Um, here in this teaser or example, 
uh, we see basically maps for winter wheat and rapeseed aggregated at one by one kilometer grid. So this kind of information could be um, presented uh, on, on a mapping service that is actually already in place uh, and could be made available to uh, a broad range of stakeholders. That brings me already close to the end and I'd like to wrap up and like to bring home the following messages. Uh, what we have kind of done is to demonstrate a proof of concept um, coming up with a scalable crop yield estimation approach. And big enablers here are clearly um, a potent geodata infrastructure, but also a cloud that actually allows public organizations to work with um, Earth observation data. Um, and uh, data products that are actually analysis ready and really boost the um, modeling or pre-processing pipelines that are in place here. Second, um, if you compare our results against the official yield statistics, we see deviations of 10% and smaller, but we are at the moment simply relying on vo voluntary um, information provided by farmers that are simply willing to do so. But from an operational point of view, of course, we would need a proper um, ra uh, randomized, stratified ran uh, sampling design, um, which isn't that much of a big issue because the actual statistical data collections that are in place at the moment, the conventional one, are relying on a sampling design. So for those organizations that would actually implement such an approach, I think there would just be slight adjustments, adjustments needed to actually um, fulfill that criterion. And of course, there's always um, room for improvements. What we would like to do um, next is to integrate um, SAR data, Sentinel-1 data, simply because Sentinel-2 optical data, as usual, suffers from, from things like cloud, uh, cloud coverage and backscatter data could compensate here um, that loss. Uh, at least that could be explored. And um, the second part is um, uh, uh, a normalization of um, the time series that we have integrated in terms of um, phenology, simply to avoid bigger temporal offsets uh, when you further scale the approach, because crops don't follow the exact time uh, in, in, in different locations, of course, because that largely de depends on, on the climate. And with those words, I'd like to leave it and thank you very much for your interest and open to questions. Thank you very much, Patrick. Anyone has a question? We can take one. Can you, at what point in the growing season, yeah. can you predict the end yields? And I guess my second question, which you didn't have to, are you proposing to replace the collection of census and survey data with this modeling approach or just downscale the effort that's like required to collect those data? This, sorry, two totally different questions. Yeah. Thanks, no, that's two, two great questions. The first one is on in yield yield prediction. So the results that I have been showing so far are retrospective. Um, because that's one major gap that has to be filled because right now we don't have a high resolution retrospective field map available. Um, so that would be a product or these are products that really fill a gap. Um, in that project, we also work on in-season yield prediction, but we're not that far yet. Uh, that work package um, isn't um, as far as the retrospective part but it would be possible following a similar approach. Um, one barrier, if you will, there is that you actually also need in-season land use data. So land use classification classified very early in the season would be needed. We also work on such a product. And there I would say from April onwards, you could at least start to distinguish between winter and summer crops and do perhaps a bit more of a coarser 
kind of um, prediction early season. Um, the second question was on... I was just wondering if you're proposing that we stop collecting census yeah. survey data or just downscale, like how much we do it or, or what the plan yeah. was there. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the idea would be indeed uh, here to use that approach not to uh, replace data collection because you need still data, reference data in Z2 data uh, in order to train those models. I, it will probably not be enough just to train a model that's based on a, uh, a certain number of years. Um, so you need basically an update. Um, perhaps every year, perhaps every two years, that is something that needs to be explored. Um, so the, the idea is really to, to perhaps use existing data collection with slight adjustments, um, but the end product, the statistical information should have added value in terms of higher, much, much higher resolution. 